Uh, <laughs> Finally. <laughs> okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, to our guests from coming from different countries and to uh, the FIDE members uh, from Saint Paul Saint Han Dynamic and to our panel. So today is our Researchability Initiative Conference 2022 on universal accessibility and inclusion for university studies and careers. This is a look for our agenda. So I will give some welcome words and introduction about researchability and the two associations which are represented today. Then Gian Maria Crego will speak about uh, some definitions and media accessibility. James Edin Hassini will speak about physical accessibility on campus and Alexandre Arnaud will speak about digital accessibility in university setting. Gael Derian Vitali will um, Vitali Derian will put some um, policy proposals uh, for you that uh, our association uh, 100% and Dynamic has worked out and make a summary of um, the previous um, speakers' interventions. Then there will be time for your questions and uh, some interactive feedback discussion. Uh, where we will start with, with uh, Ibrahim um, uh, Hamzawi and then some others of us on what we imagine uh, that needs to change so that there will be universally accessible campus for, for us available in the future. So a few words to, to my person because some of you never met me, others know me quite well for a few years. Um, I'm trained as a biochemist. I'm Alexandra Notnagel. I'm German. I came to France uh, with a Marie Curie Fellowship, and I'm currently working for a big IT company as accessibility and digital inclusion expert. I founded the initiative Researchability in 2018, and uh, since then lead it in both associations, which I will present to you in the next slides. I'm as well in um, the board of directors of Saint Paul Saint Dynamic and hold a mandate for them in the working group European and International Issues, Application of Conventions and National in the National Advisory Council for Persons with Disabilities in France. Um, I'm a young person with disability myself, depending on the environment. I mean, I may be enabled or disabled. And um, yeah, I hope today the situation will be fine. Uh, if not, uh, just uh, bear with me and be kind. <laughs> um, so the Researchability Initiative, as I mentioned, was born in 2018. And from the beginning, it was a multi-association approach. And uh, it's focused on researchers with disabilities, but also on research about disability. Since 2019, it became a subgroup in the association Marie Curie alumni in diversity and inclusivity working group, which is part of genders, equity, diversity and inclusion working group uh, of the association. It also became a commission in the association that we held the conference in today in Saint Paul Saint Dynamic. And most of our members are present here today. Mm. Ah, there's a picture of our first conference, which we have held in Vienna, where also a few of our speakers uh, from today were present in the founding session. The mission is to support careers of students, researchers with disabilities, and to, in the first place, make, um, make the professional environment accessible. It's about a more inclusive research system with equitable chances for persons with disabilities. We have four pillars that we focus on. So in this associations, we mostly um, work on individual support with the students we can follow here personally. We also look to educate the ecosystem about what disability is, what inclusion means, why we say equity rather than equality, and what the importance of accessibility is. So obviously today, the session which will be recorded is part of this education program on our, our aims and these topics. Uh, we also focus on supporting research and experts on those topics and wish to give visibility to researchers um, that study the issues that are key for us. 
the last pillar is that we do networking and uh, work on policy making on international level. So it's key for us that you, the international students, came to meet us because nothing about us without us. And if we want to do international policy, it is key that we collaborate with our different cultures with different experience and that we do this together. So a few words about La Fede 100% and Dynamic for those who connect uh, online and who don't know yet. Uh, for the others, I hope you could experience in this day and meet um, by, with our members and activities uh, um, and feel what the network is about. So the um, slides will be in French, but I will provide access to the information just saying what is on them in English. So the values of 100% and dynamic um, are based on the fact that it's the only movement which is nationally active and uh, yeah, directed uh, directly by young people with disabilities, uh, which based on, on a peer emulation of young people and persons with disabilities, but also obviously as we focus on inclusion by students without disabilities. So it's about helping each other in an inclusive, community. It's about autonomy of the young people with disabilities. And it's about the voluntary engagement for an inclusive society. The way we work here um, on the slide are represented the five key factors which will um, which are represented in our network uh, and which uh, are federated because they all have some importance for the success of young people with disabilities in society. It's companies, for sure, that supported the creation of the, of the association and continue to support the activities. Um, it's about specialized associations, uh, which focus on uh, inclusion uh, and insertion activities of people with disabilities. It's about the network of the young people with disabilities themselves, which are working as volunteers in our associations, and about a network of associations from students at universities, which are members of the association as well. Um, we also have um, higher education institutions that partner with the association. We speak about more than 250 um, more people here uh, with over 500 members um, uh, that are young people with disabilities and over 1,500 uh, volunteers. The network is um, uh, active all over France in um, 14 groups which are um, focusing on different topics, uh, interesting, identified as interesting by the young people of disabilities themselves. Then there's um, 83 associations which are members and uh, 11 specialized organizations, uh, 23 higher education institutions, uh, and um, yeah, more than 100 uh, companies uh, supporting. It's a large network. So here, what I want to point out is uh, um, the working groups which are active um, at the moment by young people with disabilities for young people with disabilities and everyone who wish to support them in the inclusive system. And so our activity, researchability, is um, here uh, visible as étude doctorale. So it's one of, of, of the, these eight commissions. Now let's look at our uh, partner organization for, for this event and uh, where also our researchability is active. It's Marie Curie Alumni Association. Marie Curie, you may have heard of her. She is a researcher um, which gave uh, the name um, to the association. Um, and uh, the association was founded in 2012 as an restricted access website. Today, it's a dynamic network boosting um, and uh, yeah, bringing together more than 70,000 members around the world. It's connecting research throughout Europe and around the world, and it enables international transdisciplinary con um, collaborations on varying topics, networking and cooperation, and mut mutual understanding among members and external stakeholders. The membership is free and open to any past uh, or present member who had a Marie Curie uh, um, scholarship. 
and um, yeah, there's some funding provided for 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 those activities. Uh, I won't go into detail of the structure of the assembly. Um, here, um, the gender. The, um, I mean, we try to have uh, gender diversity, and we study obviously the development of the ne network. The key message here is that there's many, many different nationalities, and um, that uh, we. Um, um, yeah, uh, organizing those members um, in in different uh, chapters in the countries where they can collaborate. Also, uh, in for example, in France, there's a France chapter, and then there will be chapters in other regions grouping together the activities, also on local level, and not only for one global conference that we ha uh, we we ha have every year. Uh, the pillars of activities for Marie Curie alumni is not only networking, it's mostly focusing on helping the researchers to develop careers, and that's where we come in, because obviously for career development, if there's any issue with disability faced, this needs to be addressed so that the uh, access to, to careers will be um, equal. Um, they've, there's a lot of work done on science policy, which obviously is interesting for us as well, because to make science more inclusive, uh, there's a need for policies. And there's also um, yeah, science communication, which is the part of giving visibility to research on, on disability, inclusion and accessibility. And for sure, if we can promote innovation, this is interesting for us, because when people collaborate, this can result in a lot of new ideas. Um, there's many different services for the members with travel grants and micro grants, a lot of initiatives and events. We're just one of so many. Imagine if there's many thousand people uh, collaborating. I mean, that's quite impressive. So I can't go into detail. Um, the uh, overall events, uh, which we counted here in a year, were over 120 and um, with over 6,000 attendees. Um, the Marie Curie um, has different working groups, like we have also in FEDE. And so I mentioned there's one which is focusing on gender equity, diversity, and inclusion transversally. So we're just a small part of this wider team, and we also look at intersectionality. Um, yeah, goals are aligned, individual support, working on policy, institutional uh, outreach, and academia and industry focus. Uh, we have uh, different task groups on communication, policy, training, the researchability one, which I mentioned before, and a lot of external projects as well. Um, an overview of the events, and I thank you for the attention, because I thought it's Im important to show that it's a national and a global association of researchers and of young people with disabilities collaborating here to, to yeah, make that happen. and. Um, I'm really thankful for that. I will hand over to our first speaker, who's Gian Maria Grigo. He's Senior Research Fellow in Accessibility and Translation at the University of uh, Macareta in Italy. He's board member of the MCAA Association and the co-lead of researchability in that structure. Happy to have you here um, in Paris today. Um, yeah, handing over to you. Thank you very much. Should I share my? Oh, that's it. Perfect. Uh, uh, bonsoir. Uh, good evening. Um, my French is too bad. So I won't even try. Uh, uh, and uh, it's very nice to be here because it's, uh, we've been working within the MCA. We've been working on uh, researchability for now quite a long time, a few years. And uh, and there was this other side, right? On the, and uh, here uh, in your organization, and so finally we can meet and uh, talk and discuss. Uh, we had a quick meeting uh, a few days ago uh, among us, uh, some of us, and uh, uh, so we distributed the things to say. Uh, I will uh, int introduce and mention some yeah, some uh, uh, things that we are know, so we will not get into, such as the difference between the medical model of disability, the, the social model of disability, but this is 
just to have some reference uh, for what I will say later. I will mention a bit about uh, some regulations, the UN Convention, but then uh, some of the regulations that, are, that we have in Europe as the European uh, uh, Union about accessibility, just some of them. And then I will uh, give a definition, a simple definition of media accessibility. And this in hopefully in five minutes, all so far, all I've uh, said five, seven minutes. And then we will look into South Africa as a case study, as an example, or something, uh, something happened a few year, years ago in South Africa about education and the use of digital uh, uh, resources for education uh, has nothing to do with disability, apparently. And then let's see, I'll give you a few hints, uh, my ideas on this and things uh, we can. So I, I, can I control the slides or not? No, okay. So disability models, can you, hello, who's next? Next one, okay. There are uh, uh, many ways to try to understand uh, the social relation of disability, the social uh, and the social dimension of disability. And uh, one, which is the very old one, is called the medical model. The idea in the medical model is that the person is the problem and you should fix the person, make it normal. That's it. Uh, there is the normal and then there is a person with disability. You have to, disability, it's just, your fault, you need to be fixed. Uh, and this was uh, is still dominant, okay? I mean, there is still uh, widespread, uh, it's, uh, it's not dominant but in many areas as an attitude. Uh, but then around, uh, in, uh, uh, nine, around the 1970s, a different idea started to uh, re re rise and uh, it's uh, uh, based on the concept uh, of uh, Alexandra, next slide. I'm trying to go fast, so please, uh, you'll see that, you'll see that uh, that impairment, it's just part of human diversity, whatever that is. Being, having blue eyes, brown eyes, being tall, it's just one of the many ways, all the, we are all different. It's just part of who we are being part of the human diversity. So if we agree on this, that there are many expression of us, uh, doesn't mean it doesn't matter, okay, well, who we are, but it's that it's, that it's uh, uh, a, a, our own identity, part of our, who we are. It's not that someone with blue eyes, it's some, it actually it's uh, someone with non-black eyes, okay, uh, uh, non-brown eyes. Uh, then if we, more or less agree on this, uh, then uh, uh, there can be another way to look at uh, a disability, and it's the social model. As I said, there are many, okay? One is the social model, uh, and uh, this was more or less born in the UK in the 70s. Uh, I'm gonna present a mild version of the social model, or the British version. Uh, the idea is that disability is the result of the human diversity, people that are different, the differences, all the specificities that we have, and the society that is built by some dominant group, some uh, perspective. Uh, think about gender, okay? A society that for a long time has been built uh, based on the idea that white, male, and so on, okay? So it's uh, 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 the social model says, no, disability is uh, the result of the diversity that we have and a society that is built discriminating them. So we need to change to fix society, not the person, but society, okay? Uh, this is just, let's put it there, then we'll uh, forget about that. Uh, uh, and, uh, 
uh, there are uh, uh, different ways uh, to see the solutions. We will go back at, at the end. Uh, the uh, um, uh, uh, you know, we have a social reality that is the exclusion. And another context where, okay, we can include, but you are a kind of ghetto, you are there. Not, uh, uh, or sometimes even the social model, things that are done, let's say, with the, that perspective that I, can end up being kind of uh, solutions that are for integration on inclusion. They are still part of society, but still in uh, uh, the uh, visit, uh, we can go to, I don't know, the Louvre uh, only on Fridays from five, uh, blind persons can only go from five to seven. It's, the, it's inclusion, it's not just, but, so you can, we can go, but it's in that little, uh, uh, so it's not full integration, okay? I cannot go whenever I want, like I know. Then, Alexandra. Uh, that, now let's see a legal overview. Otherwise I will last half an hour instead of 15 minutes, <laughs> sorry. Uh, let's see, uh, legal overview, so next one. Uh, just a couple of quick things. The, the UN convention, of the, uh, the rights of persons with disabilities. Uh, this was uh, approved uh, uh, 15 years ago. Uh, there are a few things that we, I think we all know about this, uh, people know about this, but it's just good to uh, re remind that it was written in a real collaborative way in the room where the, the, the convention uh, 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 was drafted, the lead, those who were leading the drafting were all legal scholars, but all represented, the all legal scholars with disabilities, all legal scholars appointed by uh, uh, organizations representing persons with disabilities. So this is, was really written, it was not imposed by someone else, okay? It's a participatory. With, nothing about us without us. This is a convention about me. I'm in the room, I'm writing it. Uh, then, and obviously the convention says that uh, it doesn't create new rights. It just says the human rights, what is the specific part of human rights within the context of uh, 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 the specificities of disability. Okay? And, uh, the, there is Article 24 that says, uh, that speaks about education. It says that uh, uh, persons with disabilities uh, have the right uh, uh, to uh, education on the basis of equal opportunity and uh, government, state parties who signed the convention shall ensure an inclusive education system at all levels. For example, uh, they should uh, uh, do this uh, in order to strengthen the respect for human rights, fundamental freedoms, and human diversity. We are going back to the, uh, the social model, okay? And uh, uh, the convention adopts the social model that I mentioned before, that view, the, the kind of mild view. Now, there is uh, the European level, A second thing that it's interesting to, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, on this slide, but the second thing that it's interesting to mention about the convention, the previous one, it says it's the first European uh, international treaty that the European Union signed, ratified and signed uh, as the European Union. It's not just France, Italy, uh, Germany, each one of us did it individually as a country, but also it's the first time that the European Union signed it as a, a, an entity, as a, as a subject, okay? Uh, there are, um, because of these, uh, obviously there we have uh, uh, as a Europe, then if we signed, then we are accepting to do some things about uh, uh, um, disability in this specific case, accessibility and uh, 
I'll uh, just mention a few things. The first one is uh, uh, some regulations uh, called Audiovisual Media Service Services Directive. Uh, it's uh, the law that supervises broadcasting, the television, uh, audiovisual productions, and things like that. And there is a part on accessibility, the old one, the first version of 2010, not so much, but the revised version, yes, a lot. Uh, then there is the web accessibility directive, I think, uh, I think that uh, uh, the others will discuss it later. And finally, the European Accessibility Act, uh, which is very, very recent. Now, what is, uh, these are regulations that have also to do with education in university, high school, and so on. But two quick examples. This is uh, now it's a very famous European law. It's the regulation for the protection of personal data. If someone has uh, uh, for um, does uh, a broken break this law in a severe fashion there is a fine up to 10 million euros so well let's be careful about that right so people you can see when we visit the websites we have to click on things and so on accept so there, there, there is a mechanism or consider for example all the laws that you have in france i have in italy on health and safety on uh, work uh, uh, a workplace. If uh, uh, someone uh, doesn't comply with those law, I don't know, in, in France, but in Italy, you can even go to jail. Uh, next one. So first part of conclusion, I will try to do, it's all conclusions are um, just reflections. So we have the UN convention, we all agree on something, and then the Europe is moving, uh, doing some laws. Uh, but, but we, uh, 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 there for the, the three regulations that I mentioned, for example, there is no a, a real enforcement mechanism. Uh, you will not get really fined. You will not uh, 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 get uh, concept, big consequences. So if you don't comply with accessibility, if you're a university, if you, I'm going to get that. If a university doesn't provide uh, uh, lessons with subtitles, recorded with subtitles, or uh, and so on, you don't get uh, that kind of implementation of uh, enforcement that we have for other things. But why? Why? So the first thing is, it's uh, it's cheesy, it's easy, uh, it's banal in a way. But since we still don't have it, <laughs> probably we should keep saying it. We need to ask for uh, enforcement mechanisms that have uh, 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 penalties. That's the, the one of the only ways. It's, uh, it's one, I mean, we are all good, all good people, but then we have laws that tell us what to do or what not. We need laws because yeah, we are all good, but we know that we will do, really act in, uh, you know, in a very friendly way with other people. If uh, there are things uh, uh, we need to follow the rules. So we need the law. It's not just on good intention cannot be like that. Why accessibility all of a sudden is just good intention and other things is, uh, then two things. Then media accessibility, I will just give you a definition of what I mean by media accessibility. It's a series of technologies in instruments to provide access to things, not necessarily digital, but also life, uh, real uh, uh, material uh, to according to the specific needs or wishes of people because one can need it in a context in other contexts don't or one can wish to have it it's just because i don't, don't need it but i wish to have it for whatever reason it's my, my uh example they are dubbing france italy use a lot dubbing or subtitles 
for uh, um, easy to read, tactile maps, audio description, just uh, interlingual and interlingual film in French, video in French, subtitles in French, interlingual film in Italian, a movie in Italian, and subtitles in French. Okay? And so on. There are many, uh, just an example. This is uh, media accessibility in the very broad sense. Now, South Africa. So what has to all, all everything I said so far with the case, uh, so what happened four years ago in South Africa? Okay. South Africa has by constitution, 11 official languages, 11. You have French, we have Italian, they have 11. Plus article six, chapter one, section six, says 11 official languages plus the uh, states the promotion of two other minority languages and sign language, South African sign language. First time sign language was in a constitution, 1998. Okay? It's written there, it wasn't added later, it's there since the beginning. Okay? It's the post apartheid uh, 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 constitution. Uh, but um, the these are all the 11 languages. I'm not going to read it. I don't even know how to pronounce it, uh, honestly. Just these two data uh, is, are important. Africans, only the 12, this is the census, uh, the, only, the, last, uh, the latest census we have, because the new census is this year in South Africa. The 12.1% uh, um, of the population speaks Africans speaks in the sense that it's mother, uh, mother tongue, okay, Africans. And 8.3% uh, uh, um, English, and then all the rest of the other language. Then obviously the people that can understand the language English are much higher, but those who can say it's my mother uh, language, okay? Now keep this in mind, Africans, is uh, the, uh, yes, Alexander, Alexander. Afrikaans is the language of what was the dominant during the apartheid, during the discrimination period of South Africa, the very long discrimination period, right? <clears throat> and those who were, let's say, in charge of society, were dominating and imposing their view, they were, came from that minority, specific language, uh, a specific minority. Keep this in mind. Now let's keep this in mind. Uh, 2018, the High Court will be something like the Supreme Court in, um, uh, in the French or at least Italian system. The High Court of Pretoria um, uh, ruled on a case. The case is Afri Forum, I'll tell you, against the University of South Africa. Okay, 26 April 2018 was the rule. So University of South Africa is an online uni only university. It's the biggest in, uh, in uh, uh, open distance university, fully open distance university in South Africa. And until uh, then, they had courses, online courses, uh, in uh, English and in Africans. Only a few in Africans, only a few. But there were a few cases like, I don't know, uh, economics one, first year of economics. So you can decide to attend it in English or in Afrikaans. At one point they said, no, only English, not Afrikaans anymore. Everything we will do is it's only, only in English. We will teach only English. You, uh, Afri Forum, who is an organization that now defends uh, the rights of the Africans minority, uh, because after the apartheid, you became a minority, right? The, uh, um, took the university uh, uh, in front of a court. I said, no, you are, we have of 11 official languages. You should uh, provide education in all 11 languages, but you don't, cannot cancel mine and prefer just English. Remember, there was just English, everything, and a few courses in Afrikaans. So the judge, a very brilliant judge, she, was, she wrote a brilliant thing. It's very nice to read the final decision, brilliant. But she had added many decisions. 
the core one was that Africans and the whole community have been dominating uh, and uh, the, the society for so long that now it's your turn to be discriminated. So that I'm sim oversimplifying, okay? But it said you did so wrong in society that uh, 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 you know it's going to take uh, this doesn't really count as a discrimination. But this is not what that I'm interested in because th there it's two part. There is a kind of philosophical, social, emotional uh, reasoning. But then there is another thing: the court, the judge, decided in favor of the of the university, remember the university of offering education only in one language, official education, because they devised a language policy and then implemented the language policies, policy where they said, well, what they said, what they, what they do, they, all the lessons are in English, everything is in English, but then everything is provided <coughs> Uh, we is uh, provided, it, it's also provided with the, what they call digital learning objects, video transcripts in all the other languages, uh, um, sub, video subtitled in the other languages, uh, in uh, the other languages, Braille in the other, and so on, okay? So media accessibility, more or less media accessibility. So the, this is the first time that a high court, everywhere as far as I know, said, and the court said, since they are doing this, they are providing, I'm obviously simplifying, I'm providing media access. So the lessons are in English, but then they are providing all the other tools, uh, videos with captions, a recording with captions, a transcription uh, in all the different languages. Then uh, they write the convention, the right to education, in this case, to languages is fulfilled. So providing these, uh, using media access instruments can be a way to guarantee the human right to education, okay? <coughs> so because uh, providing, you think about all the possible courses in, of a university provided in 11 languages, so you can choose, uh, it will be impossible, it doesn't exist, it will cost, uh, uh, you know, feasibly, it, it cannot be done. All, every single course, you have a professor that teaches the same course in, uh, in a language, and then another that teaches another language. So they chose one language, but then they are provide, using media access to do, and the course said, yes, this is a good way to guarantee the human right to access. Now. I'm almost done. Go next one, next one, next one, next one. Okay, conclusion part two. <coughs> next one. So conclusion part two is, and then it's part three, it's a three slides, so I'm done. The uh, conclusion part two is, what has to do with, first of all, well, I think we can see already, right? What has to do with the, the uh, uh, disability the convention, the rights that, uh, in that case, the, I, the court said, uh, look, the right to education in a university, and, and the court was speaking about uh, the uh, human rights uh, by in the relation to languages and cultures related to, you know, uh, different cultural, uh, linguistic cultures, okay? But the idea is that using uh, some tools, can guarantee a human right to access to education. So the first thing is that we all know this, okay? We all know this, but probably I haven't seen this mentioned anywhere else, this uh, decision anywhere else as a kind of, okay, this is a high court that for the first time said, uh, okay, in a different context, but said that these tools are good for the human rights. So, for guaranteeing human right to education. So let's move from language to something else. Then at, at this point, the decision can become you know, a first step. So the idea will be to uh, first spread the word, but then to try to join forces because uh, 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 the, 
in South Africa, I'm not going to get into this. In South Africa, there is the opposite uh, way. The, uh, this thing, if it was about, if it were about disability, we have to trust me on this because I can get into all the examples and laws. If it were about disability, uh, uh, they will, I will have some doubt of, of an outcome of that case because the idea, as, as I still perceive disability, it's the ghetto that I mentioned, you know, something special. Uh, uh it's uh, uh it's really you know in an old style you can see it if you look at uh, uh other documents so the first idea will be try to join forces between uh, disability and language so the right to access about disability but then there is also a cult linguistic culture linguistic minorities linguistic rights we have to try to join forces because we need a critical mass uh, because I think that the only, only the just the idea that the position that oh, but this is a right or this is bad, so this other good. I, I, I mean, that's uh, no one will kill anyone. You know what I mean? That's uh, so we have to uh, uh, try to join forces to create the pressure, uh, a pressure. Uh, based on what I said in the first conclusion. So this is a try to join forces. It's not just about disability, but it's about linguistic diversity. It's about, uh, and so on. Uh, the louder, the better. And finally, the last point, what has to do again with uh, media access and education well, and the university. Let's go back to media access, subtitles. So subtitles are done according to some guidelines. And uh, so let's assume we do all the lessons. The lessons is something we discussed uh, uh, during the, the, this pre-meeting. We do these uh, lessons uh, 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 online, they are recorded, that someone uh, creates subtitles and there are different guidelines. Uh, the French TV, public TV probably has its own guidelines. The Italian has its own guidelines and there are lots of guidelines. Who wrote these guidelines for subtitling? It's, I'm just talk, talking about an example, okay? Subtitling, but it can be some any, anything else. Who wrote these guidelines? Old style, someone in a room that decided uh, it's good to write, uh, to have uh, uh, subtitles done this way. The old style was this. Guidelines were decided by someone in a room. Who was in the room? Uh, the new trend, and they were not even scientific. So there was no research that supported them. The new, the new trend, the recent trend we all know, it's what is called the poly, research-based policies. So you do research, you understand what's the, okay, this is true or not? What is, what, what's the evidence? And then uh, uh, you create policies, uh, for example, guidelines on how to write how many characters for how many seconds uh, how can you omit some words uh, how can you ex uh, add some other words and so on based on research so this is uh, how policies are done now usually it's a research-based policy so it's not just invention of someone in a room it comes from research so it's uh, from you know we know we have data what people uh, really do what are the, the problems and then we create but in their research, uh, in their research, are people, persons with disabilities, only the subject, the test subject, which is, it's already something, okay? But are only the test subject or are also part of the researcher, researchers, are also they in the room when the data no, the, the results, we do a research, a study, we think, uh, how do you like your uh, subtitles? So we test your uh, the eyes, how uh, can read it better or uh, and so on, all the different things. But then, and from this, we create the guidelines. But who's in the room again, interpreting the data? Who is in the room uh, in the research projects, in the industry projects and so on, right? That they create subtitles guidance for subtitles just an example huh? uh, still at least based on my experience there is a, a lot of the uh, a lot of the cases 
are uh, are uh, done. Yeah, it's a research based. So it's a research done with, sorry, on persons with disabilities in that sense, because data comes from there, but is really with, together, not so sure. So the, and I'm gonna mention all that the, uh, this is the last, uh, so go to the first one, the previous one. So I, because I want to read what I, okay. I'm gonna quote, <coughs> Uh, a, a text from uh, uh, two lines from a research article published in a journal. It's well known. Uh, a research article is about audio description. And uh, at the beginning, uh, this article says, okay, audio description is, but then does the, provides the experiment of uh, studying the film. The audio description by the researcher, this is the definition, okay? The goal of audio description is to eliminate the barriers imposed by the sensory impairment when enjoying an audiovisual product and to place the person with visual impairment as close as possible to the normal viewer. Having the same information and enjoying the film in the same way. This is medical model. The I cannot see the movie, not because the movie was created without audio description, but because I'm blind. It's my fault. Audio description, it's not a way to change the movie, but it's a way to make me as close as possible to the normal viewer. Okay, medical model. And the way I experience has to be the same way. No, I have my own way. The, the way I watch the movie, he watch a movie, she watch, uh, she watches a movie, and so it's different. <coughs> so if this is the idea, we can all even do the the, the test with the. There is a feedback. I don't know. All of a sudden, I don't think so. Yeah. No. No. Anyway. I'm done. Uh, can you go to the next one? Yeah, I'm done. Merci should be the next one, right? A conclusion part three. Yeah. Yep. So the final thing is that involvement. Uh, uh, so this is a problem, right? So what is, in my opinion, we because if that's the attitude, then I can uh, do all the experiments, all the research, uh, so I can have data. But when I'm interpreting the data, I'm reading, the, I'm transforming the data into policies, into regulations, into laws, into guidelines, how to write, uh, to do an audio description. I'm still doing it uh, with my medical attitude, right? So that's, okay, it's good, but then I'm still doing it and yeah, I'm fixing it. The last year, the uh, last year or two years, so last year, the FCC, it's the American agency for uh, communication in charge of all the, you know, broadcasting communication. They published the, their guidelines for all description. And if you read them, you can really feel the idea that there is uh, the, this normality that uh, audio description is making viewer normal. Uh, so the final thing is that probably it's not just having more researchers with disabilities by having in general persons with disabilities in the room also when research is done uh and that's it merci thank you very much jan maria um Maybe because it was quite long, is there any questions at the moment before we move on? No, okay. So then we will come to Champs Edin Hassini, who is a um, research assistant at University of Lorraine, researchability referent and in the board of directors of 100% and Dynamic. And he has a mandate in the working group accessibility conception universelle in um, the um, as well in the national advisory council for people with disabilities in france welcome james 
Thank you. So good evening. Sorry for my English. Uh, I have a bad English, but uh, I will try to, to be uh, clear. So uh, I will give you a short overview of uh, what is the urban accessibility and especially in uh, the university. Firstly, I will uh, introduce myself. So I am a PhD su student in urban planning and I work on the accessibility of people with disability. I have a, a social approach. So in the social approach, in the French definition of accessibility, accessibility is to have no restriction on social participation. It's the researcher uh, who called uh, Benoit Hero who made this uh, definition. What is a social participation, it's to have the same habit of life of uh, as all the society, is to have the choice to live our own life and to make our own choice and uh, to not have some constraint about uh, about uh, some choice or some life who are uh, related to our health or a medical uh, situation. So there is um, a definition of accessibility in social approach. And there, there is, and uh, after there is uh, accessibility in the built environment, the urban accessibility or the physical accessibility. What is accessibility in the urban environment? It's to not have any barrier in our movement, in our mobility, in the urban space, in the city. So this is my, um, my research. And you can... Uh, and in my uh, research, I uh, try to make some um, duality between urban accessibility, we define it, and urban attractiveness. What is urban attractiveness? It's all the activity in the city that allow us to have um, uh, a good feeling or a life um, in yes, an, a good experience of the city in with our body and our spirit. It's feeling good in our body and in our spirit. It's just like all the cultural activity or the sports activities, artistic activities, tourism, uh, heritage, um, um, all the um, gastronomic activities. And uh, this is the attractiveness of the city. And in some studies in uh, urban planning, we saw that in the city, sometimes there is a duality between urban accessibility and urban attractiveness. There is some uh, activity that we say that they are not essential and other activity that we said that uh, we say that uh, they are essential, just like work, study, eat and sleep. And we saw that uh, during the, the COVID um, lockdown, yes, we didn't have all the cultural activity, artistic, and the, the, there was a, a duality between, between essential and no essential. But this situation, the people with disability leave it always. They have some restriction on some cultural, artistic heritage because the city, the, um, the old city in the, it have, it has uh, some uh, big uh, barriers for the mobility of people with disability. And this situation, uh, there is some uh, discrimination because people with disability, they can't have the same life, the same urban life than the rest of the society. And the question that we can, um, we can pose, it's which accessibility for which activity? 
can we let the urban planner or just the politics say that uh, yes the the person with disability uh, needs to eat and to sleep and to to work and that's it or we can give him some urban life some normal life we can give him a choice of the life that we, we that he needs that he wants because in some situation the person with disability lives lives in the city um he, ca he can't um, go everywhere but he go where he can he don't have the power of choice so he he choose he choose his uh, activity his uh, urban life just from the accessibility and uh, this is the the first factor of choice it's not the attractiveness it's not the um, some opportunities some uh, some some desires it's just from the accessibility where i can go and not where i want to go and uh, you can and this is um i talk about the chain of movement because in some cities there is uh, accessibility but in the in, uh, punctual spaces there is not a continuity of accessibility for example the person with disability go out he want to go to his work sometimes he find um, a bus stop which is accessible but before and after the bus stop maybe there will be uh, some one meter or two meter of uh, inaccessible sidewalk and this can broke all the chain of accessibility uh, of um, mm -hmm. movement so it stops his movement and all his uh, his journey and other factor in the uh, in this chain of access of movement there is a simple chain of movement home work or study home and there is um you can uh, go there is another more um, realistic chain of movement who which the um, a person with disability go from his home go for um, to um, an attractive uh, activity sports uh, uh, theater museum he go also to to work and he go to shopping and then he returns to uh, to his home and in some cities the people with uh, disabilities can do only the simple chain of movement you can uh, write on that yes. next yes. okay in the beginning we define what what is the urban accessibility and now i want to make some parallel between the city and the university because some researchers tell us that uh, the university is a sort of a microcosm or a small city there is uh, essential activities which are study because uh, it is uh, obligatory and other activities which are considered just like uh, a non-essential uh, activities, just like culture, health, um, associative uh, activities, um, restoration, and other uh, extra activities. And in some universities, the accessibility are, uh, is made only in the essential activities only just for following the courses the lessons they make accessibility only on um, access 
on a class classroom, on amphitheater, on uh, buildings, but they don't they don't um, try to make all the campus, all the university with the, all its uh, activities accessible. They don't try to make a, a chain of movement between studies, lessons, and course, and for example, a cultural uh, activities, uh, a canteen, uh, uh, associative activities, uh, and other activities. And in this situation, there is some segregation that can be created. For example, me, I am, I will give an example of wheelchair. I am in wheelchair and I am with a group of friends. We want to go to the canteen to eat. In the, some canteen, there is only one room which is accessible. So, the person with disability can feel some embarrassment with his friend that he constrained them to, to eat in this room. Maybe it isn't the place, the more uh, pleasant room. Maybe his friend don't want to eat in this room. So it can uh, make, some, uh, make some segregation between the person, the student with disabilities, and his friends. Okay. And um, I, um, I told you uh, about uh, social participation. In university is the life student. And all the attractiveness, urban attractiveness in the university, it's all the, um, the extra, extra, uh, extra, extra activity, or I don't know how we call it. And we can change this because there is a visible barrier from urban barrier, then there is an invisible barrier. We can change all the invisible barriers who are, um, I don't know how we call it, um, or the, um, the bad perception. Bias. Yes, for student or the bad perception of disability. They don't know, the student don't know what is the disability. So we can change it by uh, make some awareness with some tools. For example, here we have the tools of this uh, association, 100% en dynamique. It's the hand inbox. It's called the hand inbox. What is the hand inbox? It's a box with some tools to make an awareness uh, activities. We have, for example, um, um, a white uh, white can. Call it like this. White can. White can. We have uh, a glasses uh, which will make uh, make us in a disability situation in in um, visual disability situation. We have uh, anti noise cask to have uh, to make us in disability situation, and students will make some uh, some awareness activities with other students. This is the first, uh, the first activity. It's more, um, it's more global activities. But in teaching, we can also make the same, uh, the same awareness situation, and we can train students in their uh, discipline about accessibility. For example, me, I, uh, I teach urban planning and architecture. You can. Uh, I teach urban planning, so I make the same activities with some scientific approach. We give them a subject, for example, here is the campus of University of Lorraine, and we, uh, we, tell, we tell them to study the accessibility of the campus. They will be uh, two by two. One 
will be in a disability situation. For example, uh, in a wheelchair or in a visual impairment situation. And the other will play the role of um, the investigator or investigator and will note all the barrier that he see in the, the campus. And after that, they will make some uh, analysis about uh, the, their exploration, about their, um, what they see, uh, and they give us some recommendation to make uh, the campus more accessible for all the people with disability and not only for the people on the wheelchair or people with uh, visual impairment. So that's it for me. We can discuss it after about, about this. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Um, is there any urgent question that you wish to ask now? Or can we move on to the next speaker? Yeah. Okay. So then let's come to Alexandre Arnaud. Um, I'm really happy to have him here as well. He is Digital Accessibility Specialist for ATOS, is part of our board of directors in 100% Dynamic, Accessibility Referent of um, 100% Dynamic, and also holds the mandate in the Working Group of Accessibility et Conception Universelle, like the GEMS in the National Council of People with Disabilities in France. Welcome to you, uh, Alexandre. I will move to your first slide. Super. Okay. Um, thank you, Alexandra. Um, what I'm going to talk today is digital accessibility, but don't be scared about the word digital. It wouldn't be something with jargon or geeky. And we are working for people with disability. It's uh, obvious to make the world more the world more inclusive, but how we measure if a digital content is accessible. It's really great to have a philosophical uh, United Nations um, sentence or um, convention. They say we should include everyone, uh, if I can summarize, but we need more precise rules. So we have some guidelines made 25 years ago by the Web Accessibility Initiative. It is something made by the World Wide Web Consortium. It's the consortium around web technologies, but their guidelines are uh, technology agnostic. So you can apply those guidelines to website, to application, to uh, anything you want to make um, if you create digital content. Those guidelines are very important because every country I'm aware of all over the world based their rules in France, in the US, in the uh, uh, European Union. We base our law on the web accessibility uh, guideline, what we call WCAG. <clears throat> but you should know accessibility seems to be something specific to people with disability, but they have a sentence, they have a quote, they say essential for some, useful for all. Um, we would like to share with you just a video to demonstrate that idea, how accessibility could benefit to everyone.
Okay, okay. 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 Okay, c'est bon. Um, yeah. Okay, so what we see, what we saw in the video is uh, how text to speech could be beneficial to everyone, but um, it's just one example, there are 10 others. Um, if we take another one we discussed just before about video or multimedia accessibility, um, uh, What we saw uh, in the university in South Africa is a great example. Uh, trans text transcription are essential for, you know, deaf blind can hear, can see the video and can have a, can't have access to uh, audio description. So rely exclusively of, on text transcription. Also uh, <clears throat> deaf people can't hear, so they rely exclusively on caption, but Maybe you are like me, you are not a native English speaker, so you need caption sometimes to understand some words. So it's also beneficial for people in the bus watching video or something like that. So if you bring accessibility to your content, to what you produce, you make the world uh, more inclusive for all, not just for people with disabilities. 
So, uh, do you have an idea how many percent of people are considered by the World Health Organization with disabilities? Uh, maybe you can guess or raise your hand to give us some, uh, maybe what you imagine. 15%. Yeah, exactly. 15% of the world population are considered with a disability. It's in more world, than in the, world. in the world, yes. So it means more than 1 billion of people all over the world have uh, disabilities. And if we are discussing about statistics just a bit to give you one more number, the last one. And in statistics, we have something called the average user or standard deviation. How many person of the world population are considered average users? Do you have an idea? How many people is it? We have 68% of the world population average user, so 32% not in the standard, not in the average user. So you need to create digital content with those, the whole range of diversity, as we talked before. So we need to take into account the 32%. It's far more than just the people with disabilities. And <clears throat> compared to urban accessibility or physical accessibility, in digital, everyone have an impact on the inclusion in the digital world. Maybe you can, you create maybe social media posts on Facebook, Instagram, or maybe you create word documents. On here, we are on researchability. Maybe you create scientific studies or some uh, thesis, some material you publish online. So if you take the tips I'm going to, to give you, in mind, you will produce more inclusive content when you will um, uh, do some digital content. So you have the power in your hand to have an impact on inclusion. Um, if we are talking some challenges uh, students with disability can have at private school, college, university, we can imagine some, some of, uh, of them. The first one could be Maybe for people studying science, you go to practice room where there is measuring tools and uh, giving feedback on screen. So people uh, with limited uh, abilities can't manipulate maybe the measuring tools. People with blindness maybe can have <clears throat> the feedback on those measuring tools. And also sometimes we have practice room with computer inside them so it will be very uh, or, uh, um, or impossible for people without specific software on the computer to be able to do the exercise do the exercises so we'll, you will you will need to adapt the computer before the session to ensure everyone can practice and participate uh, you need to ensure the book to provide to students are available in an accessible format digitally. Uh, it concerns both people with motor disability that can turn page on paper. It concerns also people with blindness on low vision. And um, you can maybe imagine there are um, braille books, but you should know many people with low vision don't know a braille on the number of books books available in Braille is quite limited. So it's not a good uh, alternative to, to digital books for this population. But uh, you should be aware how um, digital can be beneficial to people with disabilities. Um, if we can, we have also a video about the topic uh, explaining on show showing Stephen Hawking, the famous physician, how digital bring to him a lot of empowerment, a lot of autonomous, a lot of ability to do his work, how it changed his life. So if we can start the video, it's uh, very interesting.
Right. Okay. Um, as you can see, uh, Stefano King rely on technology to, to live, but I can share a personal example. I had just a two hours before coming here. I have my transport, public transport pass, which had no credit on it, and the computer inside the uh, subway station are not accessible to recharge the pass. So I can do it with my phone with a software called a screen reader. It's a software reading screen for blind dyslexia on so on with a text to speech as we've seen uh, before. And I can also overcome some accessibility challenges I can have. Um, student can have also maybe if you don't have access to a print, um, you don't have access to a printed book because you are blind, you can use text recognition, what called OCR, optical character recognition, to extract the text from the book. So you can a bit overcome your accessibility challenges with technologies. Uh, but I'm pretty sure you are all aware technology are not perfect. If you maybe used uh, Google Home or I don't know, um, uh, Alexa, Siri, and so on, you see, sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't work. It's the same for recognizing text recognition technology or technology describing images. So you should be aware of this, this myth. We don't have already technology making people able to overcome accessibility barrier we have. So it's really, really important to take into account um, accessibility when you create content. You can expect people to be able to break the barrier. Also, to be able to use technology to overcome some trouble, you need to be skilled, you need to be trained, you need to be really, really aware of technology. And another myth we face when we discuss about technology is quite similar to the social and medical models we discussed before, is some people imagine it would be better to create specific digital content for people with disabilities, specific application, specific website, or I don't know. Maybe most of you are quite young, but um, 15 years before we saw on the internet, when you go to a website of maybe the Institut National des Jeunes Aveugles, INJA, a French institute just for people with low vision or blindness, two versions of the same website. One for the stand-up person without uh, visual impairment, and one for the people with visual impairment. <clears throat> it looks like a good idea, but in practice, it often doesn't work. Um, you rely on a minority to update the website. You need to ensure the person creating both will keep them synchronized. Maybe you can have just the normal website updated and the specialized website not updated. Also, it's a big problem for cooperation between people with disabilities on other people. How you can collaborate on a software, share tips, share tricks, share documents. If you use different software, it's a big trouble, big problem you can, you can face. So, if you can, don't create specific uh, content for people with disability. Um, just try to make your digital, maybe your digital publication on social media uh, universal, universally accessible. Um, we, um, um, okay. Uh, da, 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 da. I forgot to mention remote school before, but we can discuss about uh, homeschooling after if you want. And um, um, I'm a bit lost. Da, 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 da. Um, okay. Okay, so we need to discuss uh, the human abilities on the computer abilities. Uh, I'm pretty sure you will really enjoy the comparison um, because depending on your capabilities, you have on your body different 
um, mobility, different input, and different output. Uh, maybe you can imagine your, your ears as an input device. You can imagine your eyes as an input device. You can also imagine your mouth as an output device. You, maybe your arm to do sign language on something like that. And on the computer, the usual way of seeing it is with a mouse, with a keyboard, and with a screen. So created at the time where uh, only fully able people uh, can access it. So when you imagine technology, you can rely on those three devices. So you need to think maybe some people wouldn't have access to the mouse because they are blind and they can move the mouse on screen they can see. Maybe they are blind, they can't uh, rely on the screen. Maybe Stephen Hawking, we just saw before, can't use at all the keyboard. So you need to provide something working for everyone on everyone's abilities. So how you can do that? The first thing is being aware of two way of giving information to people. You have one way that is the screen. Okay, you are all familiar with the screen. And the second way I call the semantic way of giving information. Uh, to give you an example, I know you are all aware of that. If you created a Word document in the past for your thesis or a Google Doc document, you had to write uh, to add a table of content. Everyone had added a table of content on a document. You had to add headings. You have multiple ways to add headings. If you just re resonate with screen, you can just change the font size of your heading and have maybe 26 font size look like a heading, but Word and Google Doc won't recognize that as a heading. So the blind person also won't be able to understand it is a heading. So you need to use the proper tool of Microsoft Word of Google Doc to tell this is a heading one, this is a heading two, and automatically your table of content will be generated. It's uh, really important for you to understand that you need to provide as much as possible the semantic. Um, there, there is other example on Word or Google Doc, like list. Maybe you need to use the list function on your word processor. There are tables. Uh, you need to rely on the default styling to ensure the semantic is conveyed. Um, if you do that, a blind person, when he or she came on the title or the heading, he will hear da -da -da. Adding one, da -da -da, adding two on. He also have keyboard shortcut to move between headings. Also for people with motor disabilities, there are speech control. You can say, I want to go to adding da -da -da, go to adding da -da -da. And if it's not a proper adding, the technology used by people with disability can't understand uh, how it works. So it was, it, 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 um, it is really important for you when you decide to choose a software to verify it produces both the visual representation, so on the screen, on the semantic representation, so used by assistive technology on for people with disabilities. And to do that, it looks like quite harder to determine if your software will produce accessible content by default. But if you type the name of your software on Google on add accessibility just on your search, you will probably get some information on that. Uh, often, but maybe most, uh, all the time, maybe most of the time, the vendor, the creator of software try to market they make accessibility. So it's quite rare to have someone making effort to do accessibility, not marketing it. So just type Google Doc, or I don't know, uh, Photoshop and so on, on accessibility to verify if the content created with Photoshop can bring both the screen view and the semantical view. 
Um, I'm going to share some tricks now when you create your documents to uh, just okay. Okay. just some ways to improve accessibility a bit. Um, first of all is color contrast um, to ensure everyone can read what you produce. There are tools to measure the contrast between colors. Okay, um, I can bring you two examples, one called contrast finder on another one called color contrast analyzer. And if you are maybe using some design tool, there are some uh, contrast checker in there. So you need to ensure a minimum ratio of 4.5 to guarantee uh, everyone could access if you are maybe in sunlight environment or if you have low vision or something like that. So it's very important. Also, you would, when you create your documents, maybe you uh, uh, have a teacher grade, you, you, you should take into account, take into account a colorblind person. If you say, uh, if you say to, to me, I uh, use red to uh, say what's wrong and green to say what's uh, true, I can't access to the content because it relies on, on different color, I can't distinguish. So you need to provide another way. Uh, one way could be to use comments on your word processor to, to, to add a semantic way of giving feedback on telling, okay, it works or it's not okay. Or maybe if it's someone uh, that can see, you can add bold on underline on your document to ensure he can have access to. So try as much as possible in your digital communication to avoid relying on colors. Uh, another problem we have with color is on graphics, on charts. If maybe you are doing a bar chart, so with three bar, one red, one green, and one yellow, if you put a legend on the right saying with squares of color, just red is that, yellow is that, and green is that, you will have the same problem. So people with color blindness wouldn't be able, won't be able to, to understand uh, which color me is with goes with which bar. So you can maybe directly add into the legend uh, the numbers you are transmitting, or maybe add an arrow going from your legend to the bar, changing um, the geometrical form. And so on, find a way not based on just color. So it doesn't. Um, to, to, to bring also a semantic representation of your chart, you can add a description on the caption below your chart. It will be beneficial for uh, blind people that can access to your, your chart and to people with cognitive disability that maybe cannot understand the chart. And one bias, bias you should avoid is to say if the text work for everyone, I should avoid graphics. There, is, there are people loving graphic, loving something beautiful. So adding both your, your chart, your graphic, your images, and the text will match everyone. So don't be too, too, too accessible. Um, if you are adding also images, and um, you need to describe them, if they are useful, but if they ju are just there for maybe uh, adding some, uh, just for design with no meaningful value, you should not describe them. And so um, I want to, to uh, reference a song of Ben Harper that said, I can change the world with my own two ends. And I'm pretty sure with the some tricks I, I given to you, you can now in your digital communication, 
change the, the way you are communicating or make the digital world more inclusive. So you have all the card on your hands and don't hesitate to ask any question if you have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexandre. Um, it's very, very, very interesting what you said because we all have responsibility if we want to live inclusivity to when we create documents to conceive them accessible. So it's really nice that you explained a few examples because we all the time produce now with the new digital way of doing meetings, PowerPoints or texts we share. And there's tools that many of us don't know. And there's even automatic accessibility checker, for example, in, in some of the PowerPoint tool versions and the newer ones. And so it will be good if everyone is aware of that and starts learning it. Thank you, Alexandra, for sharing a few of the tricks. So I now hand over to the conclusion of our conference to Gail Vitali Darien, who is a PhD student in material physics in Saclay University. She is also one of our researchability reference in Son Poisson Dynamique, and as well the referent of the Association for Higher Education. Welcome, Gail. And Thank you for wrapping up what we've learned. It was so rich the information. So thank you for making it accessible for our memory. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you everyone for participating in this conference. Thank you, you the audience. And I think that the main thing that we can like uh, remember from these talks is that, yeah, there is, we need to do, to make some improvements that we work has to be done and at several levels. The low level like low has to be reinforced and made the right way and also students life i mean university is is accessible in some ways but the student part the student life and enjoyment is usually not accessible at all and universities they also usually rely on websites and apps that may be more accessible if they use the tips uh, provided by alexandre so I think the, the main word that we can uh, remember from these talks is that inclusion, we need more inclusion and we need to work for, inclu for inclusion. And to link that, I will quickly mention some propos that, proposals that we've made uh, in researchability um, that we have given to the government. Uh, it's, okay, you don't need to read everything, but there are two main parts that I mentioned here, the European policy, so the proposal 30, it's about the continuity of accessibility that James mentioned. And also the, the 32, it's the European recognition. So now we're coming back to the low side that uh, Jan Maria mentioned. And back to the research, uh, to the graduate studies that I think a lot of us are facing right now. So we need more inclusive policy as students, but also in our research life. And in the end, the perfect resume for what we just said, it's like making things accessible, making everything accessible, not only the classes, not only the canteens, just the whole student life. Thank you very much, everyone. And I hope you enjoyed it. Do not hesitate to ask questions, whether right now or during the gala. Or if needed, uh, you can contact us by email. We have an email for uh, our committee and an email for the biggest association on Dynamic. And um, I hope you enjoyed the conference. And thank you very much once again for the audience and speakers. Okay. okay, so I'm back. 
Um, yeah, so I, I wanted to thank for sure the, the audience for, for your interest and also the two researchability teams who, which have prepared this conference and all our supporters and collaborators. Um, sharing at the end that uh, this project, which now runs for a few years, um, got some recognition in the last Marie Curie conference with a social impact award for the work we are doing and we continue to do and we hope that you wish to join our education and research environment. So don't hesitate to give us feedback whenever you wish. And we're looking forward to exchange with you personally in the future and yeah, to discuss more. Thank you.